or we wear it to the waist and we wear leg stockings the way from the waist down we nobody is going to argue that that is permissible we all recognize it is not permissible because of the fact that the garment shows the shape of the aura and that's what socks do it is not a requirement to wear socks what is a requirement is that that outer garment or the garment you're going to wear in prayer should come down and cover the tops of your feet as a norm of course when you go into sujood and so and so maybe your heel will the bottom of your foot will be exposed that's not a problem because that has just happened by itself out of your control what's required is not to say you have to wear a garment which is so long that even when you make sujood it should still be hanging on the ground no because of course you can't walk you'll be tripping over your garment the whole time right but what is requirement is that it comes down when you stand normally it comes down and it covers the tops of your feet that is the basic dress requirement and as we as Muslim men would insist that our wives follow these instructions we should also know that in the same way women are not allowed to wear leotards and claim that they're covering themselves we are not allowed to wear pants which when we sit down when we uh, make rukur when we make sujood these garments hug and expose our private parts in the same way we're not allowed to do it and one of the conditions for salah for its validity is covering the aura so we don't want to have a double standard you see this is a very sad situation you know which the west when they look at muslim men they have the women covered from head to toe and the guy's walking around in shorts and you know he's looking like everybody else he's blending in you know this, this is the double standard you know when i went to malaysia just recently because during the summer a lot of saudis were more religious more religious they go to Malaysia for holidays because it's a Muslim country as opposed to going to Europe a number of them have gone there but the wives are covering with niqab and everything and the guys are they're wearing shorts the shirts tucked in you know and of course when they sit when they bend everything out is exposed it's just it has become a norm but in fact it is a major error it has to do with identity because when you ask brothers well brother why can't you wear a top which comes down okay you want to wear pants no problem but wear a top which comes down to your knee that covers that area so that when you bend when you sit when you do whatever you do your aura is not exposed it's not fashionable you know it's a uh, old country the home country backwards you know the old days no these garments which the forefathers in places like india pakistan in nigeria these places they developed these garments because they were already wearing some kind of pant like thing so what they did was they modified their garments so that they would fulfill the requirements of covering and that is what is on us unfortunately many of us have embraced western uh, culture and this is something which is a product of colonialism where people who worked in the colonial administration or wanted to get jobs in the colonial administration they knew they realized that you could only advance you could only get a job if you looked like your colonial master the more you look like him the more he brought you up so the men started dressing like western people 
And furthermore, when they were invited to gatherings, you know, with the colonial administrator, family was there and everything, he now was telling his wife, well, you know, because the colonial administrator, his wife, her hair is all out and everything else. So he tells his wife, well, you know, maybe take it down so it'll look like them. So you've got the tradition now in Pakistan, you know, of what you call this thing, dupata, right? Which is a, a symbol of a scarf worn across the shoulders, huh? which may be put on the head sometimes it's so small you can't put it on the head if you put it on the head it's see-through anyway you may as well not have anything on your head you know? and that has become the tradition in that area so we need to look seriously you know at these uh, cultural deviations which have taken place in the ummah and we need to correct these things you know of course some people say well hey this is a small thing. We have Muslims dying in Chechnya, dying in Kashmir, and you're talking about covering, you know, you're wearing a long shirt to cover your aura. Hey, the reality, as I always say to brothers who raise this point, if you are unable to cover your aura for your salah, and when you leave your home, you will not be able to go and make jihad for the sake of Allah. You will not. Yeah, you'll take a trip over there. You know, you had people when, it was, when the Afghan war was on, people went there. So it could be said, I went to Afghanistan. You know, this was like a badge. You know, you could wear it as I was in Afghanistan. But what did you do in Afghanistan? You went there... You weren't trained, you didn't have any, you know, the, uh, the, the Mujahideen, they were living in the mountains, in the snow, they had to carry you up the mountains and carry you down the mountains. You couldn't, you couldn't. In fact, you were a hindrance to them. You almost got some of them killed. <laughs> but you came back, you held a clashing cough whilst you were there, you came back, I, I was in Afghanistan. <laughs> you know, this is the point. You know, those people, this is what they're talking about, you know. It's jihad. And they can't deal with this jihad nafs Because that's what it's about, isn't it? Jihad nafs If the person cannot make the jihad of the self to obey the instructions of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then they're not going to be able to make the jihad for the sake of Allah. That's reality. So, the Sahaba, they gave that clarification for us they are the ones who gave us as I said the circumstances in which the verses were revealed we need to depend on their understanding for the clarity of the Quranic text we need to depend on their understanding now there are some of the companions who were former Jews who accepted Islam and they also narrated what was in Jewish texts which seemed to be related to some of the verses or some of the concepts there in the Quran this, these narrations came to be known as Israeliat Israeliat or the Israelite narrations it is generally accepted amongst the scholars of tafsir that these cannot be relied upon for clarification of Quranic texts. They may be relied upon for further confirmation of Quranic texts, which is a different thing. Meaning the Quran said this, Prophet Sassam explained it that way, and we said, yeah, look, also in their narrations this confirms what the Prophet ﷺ also said so it's a secondary use but not that we're going to take a verse from the Quran then we bring an Israeliat and say that's what it means because it's what it said there in the writings of the Jewish rabbis etc. no we cannot do that not acceptable so these although these were conveyed by the Sahaba 
They were just conveying information which was out there. And Prophet ﷺ did say in the hadith which is Sahih in Sahih al Bukhari, Hadithu an Bani Israel wala haraj. You can talk about uh, the Israelites, what they say in their books, and there is no sin. You can talk about it. Now, talking about it is one thing. You know, it's like stories. You can hear stories. But using it as a means of seeking knowledge is another thing. That's why when Prophet Muhammad saw Umar, radiallahu anhu, reading the Torah, Yarhamkallah, reading the Torah, he became angry with him. And Omar he couldn't really understand why, you know. And Prophet Muhammad said that if Prophet Musa came, he would follow what I have. And what is there in the Torah is not an authority. It is not a source of knowledge. It may be confirmational knowledge if it has been verified by the Quran or by the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, but not as an independent source for clarification. No. And it is wrong. And you find the tradition of some of those who have deviated in the explanation of the Quran that they will go into the English Quran and then they will bring things from the Bible and all these sources and use that to explain the Quran. This is deviation. This is wrong. Prophet Muhammad opposed it tooth and nail. This is error. The fourth level of interpretation is that of tafsir of the Quran by the language. Tafsir of Quran by the language. By the Arabic language. The Arabic language as it was revealed. Important point. Not just by the Arabic language in general. Because languages evolve. In the past, in ancient Arabic, Ta'ira meant bird. And it was also used to refer to anything which flew. Today, ta'ira is used to refer to an airplane. So now if you use the modern understanding of ta'ira and go back into the Quran, you know, you could create havoc. You literally could create havoc with the meanings of the Quran. The Arabic language for those things which have not been explained by the Quran in context, not been explained by the Sunnah, not been explained by the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. we then go to the Fusha or classical Arabic. There are dictionaries of classical Arabic. The main one is called Lisanul Arab or the tongue of the Arabs. It's like 20 something volumes. Yeah. From that we now can extract the correct meanings based on the Arabic as it was understood at that time. An example where not following that procedure can lead to serious deviation is a circumstance which I came across when I was giving a lecture in New York City in, um, I think it was Master Taqwa, there in Brooklyn. And I was giving a le lecture, it was on Tawheed, and I was talking about fortune telling. And after explaining about fortune telling, I went into astrology. And I explained that astrology was a form of fortune telling and it is forbidden in Islam. Haram. A brother jumped up in the back of the group. 
He said, no, it's not. He was a Muslim astrologer. Right? He jumped up. He had been writing charts for everybody else, you know, Virgo and Pisces, and he, he was making out the charts. He jumped up. He said, no, it is permissible. I said, no, it is forbidden. Prophet Muhammad said, Allah said so in the Quran. I said, I really don't think so. He said, yes. Surah Al-Buruj. He whipped out his Yusuf Ali translation. Here we are with Yusuf Ali again. And he read Yusuf Ali's translation of Buruj, which was the zodiacal signs. The signs of the zodiac. So he has a law swearing. Wasama'i dhatil buruj. By the, sign, by the sky and the zodiacal signs. Ooh. Yeah, so it's, there it is. This was his evidence. To justify fortune telling. The reality is that yes, modern Arabic, Buruj has come to refer to the zodiacal signs. This is true. However, in classical Arabic, the, the Buruj refers to the constellations. The combination of the stars in the sky as they are. Not those images which were superimposed over these constellations by the Babylonians and the Greeks and the Egyptians, which form the basis of astrology. No. It just meant the constellations. This is critical. And this is why, as I said, going to that English interpretation of the meanings can be dangerous. If a person hasn't found himself or herself a reliable translation the most reliable translation around today in spite of its cumbersomeness and clumsiness of reading is the noble Quran the noble Quran by Mohsin Khan it's not very good reading because of they've put they've put so many things in brackets and it's very you know to give it to a non-Muslim even to read it, you know, I found people don't like it. Really, they don't like it. So if I were to give one for reading, I would choose the Quran, which was done by Sahih International. Right? Comes out of Jidda. This is one of the better, best translations. It flows. It's free of the uh, Old English thou's and thy's, etc., and it's pretty accurate because it was based partially on the noble Quran anyway but the most meticulous in terms of giving the correct explanations is the noble Quran a person working with that inshallah is on safe grounds but the other things out there you know Yusuf Ali in particular has got major problems Muhammad Ali also, uh, which, was a, it, which was the standard translation used by the nation of Islam, right? Uh, wherein Muhammad Ali was actually a Qadiani. He was a follower of the false prophet, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. You know, Elijah Muhammad, he got much of his teachings from the Qadianis. And you can see in his book, Message to the Black Man, that about two-thirds of that text are direct quotes out of the standard text used by the Qadianis, which were in English. You can see it word for word. Plagiarism. Anyway, as I said, it's very important that we are aware that in understanding the words of the Quran we must use the classical Arabic because by taking this step the seriousness of fortune telling so great that Prophet said whoever visits a fortune teller 
out of curiosity. His or her prayers are not accepted for 40 days and nights. This is very serious. Meaning that if you flip open the newspaper and you go to the page of the Steins, right? The looking to see what they have to say about Pisces today or Virgo or whatever, you have visited the fortune teller. Because this is the modern day version of how the fortune teller operates. In the past, they used to stay in caves like the oracle at Delphi, ancient Greece. Or they had little shops somewhere in the cities. With the newspaper, they eventually got a column and that's where they now put out their fortune telling. So when you go to it, you are going to the fortune teller. And I know people say, I don't believe in it. That's not the point. You go there, you have gone. And you fall under the heading of one whose prayers for 40 days and nights is not accepted. Of course, some people may say, oh, well, I read it today. No point in praying for the next 40 days. No. <laughs> yeah. No. Because the prayer is not accepted for the next 40 days and nights, it doesn't mean that the obligation of prayer has been lifted. No. Because when we pray, two things take place. One, we remove from ourselves the obligation of Allah on us to pray. And secondly, we earn for ourselves reward. That will depend on how we pray the level of consciousness by which we pray. The reward will be proportionate. So what is taken from those prayers is the reward. There's no reward. For the next 40 days and nights, no reward. You have lost the reward for those prayers. But the obligation of prayer remains. Because if you abandon the prayer now, you've fallen into a greater sin. Prophet ﷺ has said, the distinction between us and the disbelievers is salah. Whoever abandons the prayer has become a kafir, a disbeliever. So, that is a greater sin. That one who does that would then be doing an act of disbelief. So, I'm just stressing this that for us to really grasp and to understand that we really do need to approach the Qur'an according to the correct methodology in order to ensure that we understand what Allah has intended here. The fifth level of tafsir is that of Qur'an by opinion. Yes, there is a place for opinion. But it's on the fifth level. The first four levels are all based on narration, narrated information. Quran by Quran, that's narration. Quran by Sunnah, that's narration. Quran by the Sahaba, narration. Quran by the language, narration. These are all, this is all narrated information to us. Where when we step into tafsir of Quran by opinion, now this is, we have stepped out of narration, we're gone now to my opinion your opinion, etc. At this point, this is opinion for application based on our understanding of the first four steps. We now need to apply this thing. We have to use our reason. We have to see the circumstance, grasp the circumstance, see what is applicable here. This is where we have place. And we have to avoid opinionated arguments. If we are following the four steps then in our application you have an opinion I have an opinion but it's in keeping with that four steps that we have we're following then we don't need to get into argument we can discuss because perhaps there's something which I didn't grasp or you didn't grasp we can discuss but to get into an argument where I'm gonna say no you are this and that no no it's wrong we should not get into heated arguments over opinions with regard to the Qur'an. 
Prophet ﷺ cursed it, saying, Opinion based argument about the Quran is kufr, is disbelief. And he repeated that three times. Then he said, What you know of it, act upon it. And what you're ignorant of, ask those who know. Refer it to those who know. So, following that methodology, inshallah, a person may arrive at the correct understanding and application of the Quran. You know, we can now make tafsir properly. But of course, there are other tools which need to be known, and um, we will not, our time frame is not sufficient to go through it. I have done a book called Usul al Tafsir which is an in-depth analysis of the methodology of interpreting the Quran where I bring in and discuss all of you know, the major other areas that a non-Arabic uh, speaker may be able to grasp and there are other areas which I didn't go into because they're deep into linguistic issues which a non-Arab is not just not going to understand, period. Right? And there's another uh, book also called Ulum al-Quran by uh, Brother Yasir al-Qadi Yasir al-Qadi He has done one which is also excellent You know, very extensive uh, That is also another good source if one wants to go in more depth in this field There is Ulum al-Quran by Ahmed van Denfer It's limited, it's not bad though It does give something of that information And there is also uh, Jamal Zarabozo's You know, how to approach and understand the Quran that's how he titled it, but it's basically covering the same issues with a lot of depth, a lot of clarity there. Uh, just to understand as examples of what happens when people don't follow this methodology, I gave you examples from people who have gone into English translations and where it has led them. We can find that the various deviant groups they also went astray using verses of the Quran to support their deviation whether it was the Khawarij who quoted from the Quran La Hukma Illa Lillah that the ruling and decision belongs only to Allah and on the basis of that, when Ali and Muawiyah, radiallahu anhuma, arbitrated their differences to avoid bloodshed amongst Muslims, they broke away, they were among the followers of Ali, they broke away and declared Ali and Muawiyah and those who followed them as disbelievers on the basis of this verse from the Quran. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud went and talked to them. He had a discussion with them. And the first thing he said to them, this group, there's about 40,000 of them, he went to their camp. And when he was going to their camp, he said that he heard a buzzing. On his way to the camp, he heard bzzz, like this. When he came, he realized they were inside of their tents in that reading Quran. And they had marks on their foreheads, you know, of sujood. They were up in tahajjud every night. You know. But in spite of this, they had fallen into a deviation which led them to declare the mass of Muslims to be disbelievers. So he, when he began his discussion with them, he said, Note, that there is not a single Sahabi among you. That's the first thing he told them. Not a single companion of the Prophet ﷺ was among them. And they've gone astray. He's pointing out that the way of the Sahaba is critical. If the Sahaba are not going down that way, you're off. And then he asked them, what are your problems with Ali? And they listed their problems. Right? They declared him 
to be a disbeliever because he sought arbitration when Allah said hukum or rule or decision belongs only to Allah and they said when the, when the arbitration was being sought uh, Ali agreed in the uh, truth that the title Amirul Mu'mineen would not be put before his name so they said if he is not Amirul Mu'mineen he must be Amirul Kafirin if he's not the, the leader of the believers he must be the lead, be leader of the disbelievers yeah. and so on they listen anyway Abdullah ibn Mas'ud dealt with their issue on the Quran he said is the blood of human beings more valuable or is the blood of a rabbit more valuable I said, of course the blood of human beings is more sacred and valuable than the blood of rabbits he said then he quoted the verse from the Quran in which Allah said that when you're in a state of ihram if you kill an animal right then you're not allowed to kill animals you're allowed to fish but you're not allowed to kill land animals when you're in a state of ihram if you kill an animal then you must sacrifice an animal of similar uh, value you kill a cow you have to sacrifice a cow and give it in atonement for this error that you've made but if it is an animal which is not from the known groups if you've killed a rabbit then you must choose two human beings two righteous men from among you and let them choose a an appropriate sacrifice for those animals which are not in the main group so if you kill the rabbit two righteous Muslims from your group can get together look and see how much you can afford whatever and they can say okay you need to kill a sheep or you need to kill a camel or whatever so this he said if Allah can have two men arbitrate over the blood of a rabbit surely for them to arbitrate to save the blood of Muslims must be permissible they submitted that was the understanding that was the understanding taking the verse in the context I mean, this is context not just context but this is fiqh this is legal understanding because one may not have been able to deduce that if somebody put that in front of us maybe we'd look at it we couldn't see you know how can you use this as evidence where's the relevance here but you see that fiqh that deeper understanding he was able to pull the re relevance from that other verse and show how the intended meaning here when, when Allah said that the rule only belongs to him that is a general concept not a specific uh, principle which then prohibits human beings from arbitrating and deciding in their matters no so if we go then to all of the groups we could go one after the other I gave you before the example of the Shia when they talked about Surah Ar-Rahman where Allah talked about the two seas coming together they said this meant Ali and Fatima and that from the two seas came the pearl and the coral and they said no that's not the pearl and the coral that's Hassan and Hussein okay this is the deviation right? because where is the authority see, this is just because they believe everything is centered around Ali, Hassan, Hussein and their Imams they need to find the Imams there in the Quran they have to put them in there to justify their claims for their preeminence so they have brought arbitrary meanings to the Quran not following that methodology at all if we follow the methodology of the Quran where Allah talks about the two seas you go elsewhere in the Quran Allah describes where the two seas the salt water bodies and the fresh water bodies is clear 
But they are not following that. They are going to their own thing. Right? And if you look at some of the philosophical groups, you find among them similar deviations and they are just taking verses from the Quran to justify their deviations. Like the Mortezilites, you know, who for them, they held that on a rational level, the Mortezilites are called the rationalists, the verse where Allah says, and remember when Abraham said, my Lord, show me how you give life to the dead. And Allah replied, do you not believe? Abraham said, yes. But I'm asking you in order that my heart may find rest. They said, rationally, logically, it is not reasonable to accept that a prophet had doubts about Allah giving life to the dead. So they needed, he needed his heart to be put to, at rest with a sign from Allah. This is their argument. Because for them rationally, the prophets are receiving revelation from Allah, etc., etc. They must believe in Allah 100%. No doubts, nowhere. See, that is their rational approach. Because for them, doubt meant disbelief. For you to have a doubt, this was equivalent to disbelief. So, what they did was they went back to this verse and they reinterpreted it. They said that when Prophet Abraham said, My Lord, show me how you give life to the dead. He replied, Allah says, do you not believe? Prophet Abraham said, yes, I believe. But I'm asking you in order that my companion by the name of heart would be at rest. So this word, qalbi, they said, that was the name of his companion. His name was heart. <laughs> you see now of course we say, where is the authority for this? This is all, human mind cannot accept this, so we're going to twist this thing somehow, some way, to get out of the obvious. So it is my heart. My buddy by the name of heart, you know, he needs to get, you know, he needs to see this sign so he will understand this re resurrection thing. Okay. Uh, the other example which we can find among for example the Sufis who focus a lot on the spiritual and they de-emphasize the material world and they you know, get heavy into the spiritual thing when they go and they look at Prophet Musa and Allah tells Prophet Musa اذهب إلى فرعون Innahu Tagha. Go to Pharaoh, for indeed he has transgressed. They say Pharaoh here means the heart. Because they're always they're into the thing of purifying that heart. It is your heart which oppresses you, tells you to do the wrong thing. So when Allah is talking about go to Pharaoh, it's meaning go check out your heart. Correct it. Right. Similarly, when Prophet Moses, uh, Prophet Musa, is told by Allah to throw down his staff, they say, no, this didn't mean literally throw down the stick that you had in the hand. Because when Allah asked him, what is in your right hand? And he said, this staff, I use it to herd my sheep and these type of things. He talked about its material uses he said when Allah told him to throw down his staff it meant cast aside the material world you see you got to focus on the spirit so of course we say where is the authority it sounds nice you know intriguing but no authority and of course 
not to be outdone we had Elijah Muhammad claiming prophethood back in the 30s and we know his basic teachings was that white people were devils and black people were Allah's and he pluralized Allah became Allah's this is basic teaching he went to the Quran and found evidence for it in the translation of Muhammad Ali uh, of the verse in Surah Taha verse 102 where Allah says there يَوْمَ يُنْفَخُ فِي السُّورِ وَنَحْشُرُ الْمُجْرِمِينَ يَوْمَ إِذٍ زُرْقًا On that day, when the trumpet is blown, we will assemble the criminals blue-eyed. So they said, he said, who has the blue eyes? Hmm? Hmm? Allah says, these are the criminals going to hell. They have the blue eyes. Huh? So, of course, when one goes into the classical understandings of this term zurqa, yes, azraq means blue. But when you go into the usage of that uh, description in classical Arabic, it refers to the clouding of the cornea, where the, the, it gets a bluish gray tinge, where the sight becomes blurred. This is what it's referring to. So, a better translation would have been bleary-eyed as opposed to blue-eyed because blue-eyed has no meaning it has no meaning bleary-eyed is the correct translation so we can see from this that where we don't follow the correct methodology then we can end up with all kinds of deviations justification for all kinds of interpretations and a note was just passed to me as a reminder when I mentioned about uh, the Sahabi who went to the uh, the Khawarij I mentioned it was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud uh, it was Abdullah ibn Abbas sorry not Abdullah ibn Mas'ud who was known Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was known as the, the greatest uh, mufassir or interpreter of the Quran his interpretations are given precedence over uh, the rest of the Sahaba Prophet ﷺ spoke about him uh, in particularly glowing terms <clears throat> anyway so when we look at the whole process of interpreting the Quran we then conclude saying that interpretation of the Quran must be based first and foremost on revelation revelation and narrated materials from the early generation their understanding the Quran in the context of the Quran in, in the context of the Sunnah explanation of the Sahaba in the context of the classical Arabic this is narrated information from those early generations this is how we get our foundational understanding of the Quran after having gone through that route we now may apply the Quran appropriately in our circumstances using human reason and this is the correct methodology this way we end up with what was intended by Allah or as close as we humanly can arrive but whenever we skip these stages and jump you know, it's directly into language, or we go into English or whatever, 